Hi everybody, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AmoryTutors.com and in this video we're going to look at amino acids. Now, amino acids are the building blocks of life and they can string together to form proteins which we'll look at in a different video. Um, but we're just going to look at basically what, the, uh, what an amino acid might look like. We're also going to look at something called the isoelectric point as well and how we can detect and separate amino acids as well. So I'm going to start by looking at the structure of amino acid. So an amino acid is a a molecule with an amine group in, which has got the NH2, and it's got an acid group in there, a carboxylic acid group, which is this group here. And they're both bonded, um, if it's an alpha amino acid, they're both bonded to the same carbon that's in the middle. Now, amino acids can come in different types, um, and that's why we've got this R group up here. And you can see that we have, in most amino acids, um, we actually have an optically active um, molecule, so we have a chiral center, and we know that because we actually have four different groups around the same carbon atom. So if we were to put that, um, and we just had one type of amino acid, so one enantiomer, if we were to put that in a um, plane polarized light box, then uh, what you would find is this would rotate to plane polarized light. Now, amino acids can behave in different ways depending on the conditions that you put them in. Uh, and we have something called an isoelectric point uh, in amino acids. And this is the point at which um, an amino acid in solution um, is the average, the average of the amino acids are actually neutral, so they don't have a charge. Um, and we come on to the next term, which is effectively a zwitterine. So zwitterines are uh, amino acids that actually have two different charges attached to them. So these have a positive charge and we actually have a negative charge. And when we take a solid amino acid, which is this here, um, it obviously doesn't have any charges, but the moment we add it into a solution, um, we can form a zwitterine, which is one of these, a double iron, um, that's providing that that solution is at the um, pH that is near that amino acid's isoelectric point. So I've drawn one here, so this is an amino acid. Again, it's a generic one, because we've got the R group in there. Um, but you can see that we have a positive charge on the nitrogen, and this forms an NH3 on this side, and we have a negative charge on the oxygen. And if this amino acid is put into a solution that is at the, at the pH of the isoelectric point, then we form what we call a zwitterine, which is this solution here. Uh, and you do need to be aware of that as well. It's really important. Um, we can change this, though. Uh, and if we take this um, solid amino acid, which is this here, and if we put it into a solution which is, has a pH that is less than the isoelectric point, then actually what you'll find is, so in other words, the solution is acidic, uh, then what you'll find is the molecule will respond to try and reduce that acidity, and so therefore um, the amino acid is uh, more likely to accept a proton uh, from the acidic solution that it's put in. And so that's why we form this molecule here. Now you can see the carboxylic acid group is unchanged. We don't do anything with that. But the proton is accepted onto the amine group, which is on the end here. And we form the NH3 end of this. So that's only if the amino acid is put into a solution that is below, uh, where the pH is below its isoelectric point. And that's what IP stands for there. And if we were to put this solid amino acid and dissolve it in a solution with a pH that was greater than its isoelectric point, then we'll get the opposite. Now, the solution that's greater than its isoelectric point is likely to be um, alkaline. So um, in that case, um, the amino acid will try to counteract the alkalinity uh, in the solution by providing a proton. And the only part of the amino acid which can provide the proton is the carboxylic acid. And that's exactly what happens here. So your carboxylic acid loses the proton or donates the proton um, to try and counteract the um, alkalinity. And so therefore you have an O minus that's left behind. Your NH2 group remains the same. You can see that there has been no change in this but there has been a change in the carboxylic acid part of it. So amino acids can um, are quite versatile. They can change in terms of the charges that they have, but um, you do need to know that the isoelectric point, at the isoelectric point, you generally form a zwitterine, and the majority of the molecules uh, have zero charge. They don't actually, um, so they're uncharged. Okay, so just the final thing I want to look at is basically how you separate these things. Now, because these are um, optically active compounds, they tend to be very, very difficult to separate. But one of the best ways of separating um, these things is using chromatography. Um, and just standard uh, paper chromatography will suffice. So uh, we can also use it not only to separate amino acids, but we can also help to identify um, 
individual amino acids and a mixture of um, different amino acids that are in solution. So we've got an example here. Here's our beaker with a solvent in the bottom of it, as you can see there. Um, we have our um, pencil line, which is on the top. Again, you've got to use pencil. Um, if you use a pen, then the, um, the ink can actually dissolve into the solvent and can rise up the paper as well. So um, the, we'll put our solvent line, sorry, our um, pencil line at the bottom. We put a, a concentrated mix of amino acids on that line there. Uh, and then we let the um, solvent rise up the, um, the paper, um, chromatography paper. Uh, and what we get after a, um, a short while, and um, we get our amino acids that start to separate. You can see here that we've got three different types of amino acids. So we know that this mixture that we originally had on this line that is no longer there because it's dissolved, um, is actually contained three different amino acids. So we've got one, two, three. Now the problem is when we do this reaction, we actually have, um, well, we actually can't see the amino acids. It's very difficult to see it. Um, and so what we have to do is we spray the uh, chromatography paper with a chemical called ninhydrin. Uh, and ninhydrin is a chemical that will turn purple on the presence of an amino acid. So you can see here that we have um, three purple spots, and it means it allows us to uh, measure the, um, uh, the distance that the amino acid has traveled up. And just the final point as well is the, um, we can actually identify amino acids by doing something called an RF point or an RF calculation. Uh, and RF is effectively um, A over B. Uh, and so A is effectively the distance the spot has traveled. Um, so I'll put that on there. So it's the distance the spot has traveled from the original uh, pencil line that you, where you put your concentrated mix and um, divided by B. And B is the distance that the solvent has traveled up the paper. So I'll put that onto there. So if you divide them two numbers, um, you'll get an RF point. And that RF point can be used um, to help identify the amino acid that's in your solution. So you can compare it against a known amount. So, um, but that's effectively it. Um, there is another video that looks into um, what happens when you string amino acids together and you form proteins. So um, uh, if you just check on the playlist, the amino acids playlist, um, and you can have a look at that one as well. And um, other than that, that's it. Just a quick look at amino acids. Hope that helps. Bye.